I am what it says I'm, I am. I will have what it says I will have. I will do what it says I will do. We are Deliverance Temple, where we love by living our vision every day. Our vision can be seen in the four C's. We connect with our Creator continually. We confess our deliverance consistently. We commit to serve creatively. We communicate Christ's love compassionately. Pastor Andre, preach this word. Amen. Thank you very much. Put your hands together. One time. Once again, it is our goal and our hope that those of us who are members will know the vision statement and hopefully see how it all connects together. It all ends up in communicating Christ's love compassionately. And so all, the, all those different ways, even what Sister uh, Ruthie was just sh saying about how if you don't feel like you have something to give that you go and you help, that's part of us committing to serve creatively finding a way to make sure that your life makes a difference wherever you go, not just in the four walls of the church, but wherever you go, that you're always making a difference. And I appreciate Deliverance Hip, all of you who have done that. All right, so today's title, I'm going to give you the title first. Normally I set it up, but I just want to start with the title. Today's title is By Any Means Necessary. Somebody say that when you say, by any means, by any means. Necessary. necessary. By any means necessary. So uh, that, that's, that's a familiar uh, saying, and uh, when I think of it, I think of Malcolm X, who would speak of that by any means necessary. But it, it speaks of being in desperate times. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And sometimes in your Christian walk, you come to a by any means necessary type of mentality. And so as we work through these things, these points are going to come from that uh, mentality. I, I've been in Christ a long time, but there's been certain seasons of my life that have been easier than others. I'm not talking about having good days and bad days. I'm talking about good seasons and bad seasons. A season meaning months, meaning every single week something is happening. Every single week something is challenging you. Every single week Something is coming against you. And I, I've been in one of those seasons since about April. And what I know about those seasons is that oftentimes on the other side of that season is something that will shake your head. It's mind-blowing blessings. But you've got to figure out how to process through those seasons. And here's what you've got to understand. Whenever I, as your leader, is going through those seasons, oftentimes the whole church goes through the season. And so I may not always tell you if I'm in a rough place, but sometimes you can feel it yourself because you catch the hell that I don't catch. So you have to be careful who you hook up with because when the devil hits them, he hits everybody. And so if you're the faint of heart and if any little thing causes you to toss and fall and fail, this might not be the ministry you want to be a part of. Because we go through attacks in this place. But sometimes in the attack, you can just pray and say, God, fix it. Sometimes you can preach your way out. Sometimes you can pray your way out. Sometimes you can give your way out. And there's other times it takes by any means necessary. Whatever you got to do, you got to do. If you got to cry all night long. If you got to talk to somebody until they can talk you off the ledge. If you if you got to pray and take a pill. If you just got to go and sit by the reservoir and just watch the water and hope you don't try to jump in there and drown yourself and just try to pull yourself together. Sometimes we're in a by any means necessary. I'm going to find a way to pull myself back up and get through what I got to get through. It hurts, but I'm not giving up. I'm trying. It's 
trying, but I'm not quitting. So what I'm going to do is what the scripture says, I'm going to hold on to the horns of the altar by any means necessary. I'm not going to stop being saved. I'm not going to stop talking about God. I'm not going to stop praising God. I'm not going to stop asking for forgiveness. I'm not going to stop coming to church. I'm going to, I'm going to do this by any means necessary. Whatever it takes, I want you to be seen in my life. Whatever it takes. If I got to confess, I got to confess. If I got to cry, I got to cry. If I, whatever I have to do. But what I love about any season I'm in, if I can find it in the word of God, it gives me hope. If I'm in a season that I can't find in the Bible, then I don't know where I'm going. So whatever I do, whatever I preach, I try to tie it to a place in scripture and see what we can get out of it. And since Mother Mitchell's gone, I'm going to be doing the reading myself. So let's go to 1 Samuel 21 and 1. It says, then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, why art thou alone and no man with thee? This is what very interesting is David some chapters before was anointed by Samuel to be the king. God said you're going to be the king. And then by divine providence King Saul who was the king started going through demonic attacks and said I need somebody who can play the, the songs of Zion because this spirit is getting me. And the scripture said it was the spirit of the Lord. So God made a way for a door to open because somebody said there is a, a boy from Jesse's family who's skillful in the heart. And so they invite David. David plays and Saul says, oh, this feels so much better. And, and Saul liked David so much, he brought him to sit at the king's table. Everything's going well. Everything's going smooth. And then somewhere in between, there was Goliath that came. And, and David killed Goliath. And everything was going smooth. But Saul got jealous. Everything was okay until the haters came. As long as I was eating spam and crackers, everybody was my friend. But the moment I started getting blessed, the moment I started getting closer to my destiny, the moment God started opening doors, all hell broke loose in my life. The moment I stepped out with my business plan and everything looked good, but now everything's going wrong. It's not always that you've done something wrong. It's the closer you get, the hotter sometimes it is. The closer you get to the sun, the hotter it's going to be. And so... He's in this season where a couple times while Saul was going crazy and David was playing the harp, Saul picks up a spear and throws it at the one who's helping him. And David is dodging. And time goes on. Finally, David says to Jonathan, which was Saul's son, I think your daddy's trying to kill me. I think I got to get out of here. So they devised a plan, and, and, and Jonathan uh, said, I'm going to basically, I'm going to check with my dad to find out, and I'm going to give you a signal to find out if you're safe to come back around the king's table, or do you need to run? Well, Jonathan let him know, you need to get out of here because my daddy's crazy, and my daddy wants your life. All because God was blessing him, and he had next. It wasn't that he had now, he had next. And here's something you got to understand. When you have next, people who have now, they become intimidated by you. David never said, I'm getting ready to take over. He was just waiting his turn, but something stirred up Saul. So here's what happened. He runs away, and he runs into this priest, and the priest finds out that, listen, Saul's after him, so David, why are you showing up here by yourself? Let's go to the next verse. Verse 2. And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, the king hath commanded me a business. The king sent me. Now, wait a second. We know from scripture that I gave you, the king didn't send him. The king's trying to kill him 
But David is flat out lying. Said the king hath commanded me a business. And have said unto me, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my service to such and such a place. David told a big old lie. First point I want to make. When you're in a by any means necessary situation, you have to understand that sometimes God will bless your lie. God bless his lies. Don't be so religious that you can't sometimes lie when you need to. Now, somebody say, yeah, I believe that because I've been lying all my life. I ain't talking to you. I lie on my taxes. Every That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're in a situation by any means necessary. Let me give you a paint a picture. Some of y'all are in abusive relationships. And you go somewhere. You go get a pedicure because you need a pedicure. And when you come back, the man wants to know where you've been. You know because of the crazy that he is, you can't tell him where you really been. And, and let me give you another example. Sometimes you got people around you that you can't tell them what you're really working on. What you've been doing? Oh, nothing. That's not really true that you've been doing nothing. But if you tell them what you're doing, they'll copy it and try to beat you and do it before you can do it. Sometimes you got to learn how to say what you got to say to preserve your life. Not, we're not talking about lying for lying's sake, but understanding the power of deception when God has blessed it. Again, I'll give you any other example because I don't want y'all leaving here and just lying to be lying. But I'm saying when it's necessary, when, 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 when you have to, to preserve your life. Sometimes you got to understand when your life is in trouble. And you got to say what you got to say in order to make it out. You got to do what you got to do to make it out. Sometimes you just got to know when God is prompting you to say what you have to say to make it out. Am I encouraging lying? No, but we look in the scripture, he lied. But the reason why he lied, somebody was trying to kill him. Don't be so caught up in the spirit that you lose your life telling everybody everything. Sometimes shut up. Sometimes say I'm going to be such and such and go somewhere else. Because these folk that said we're going to shoot your house up. I know you can pray, you can plead the bud, but some of them folk are crazy. Don't tell everybody where you are, what you're doing with your kids. Sometimes you got to deceive the enemy so you can get out alive. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You deal with people that come home drunk and they come home crazy, come home with firearms. You got to know how to say what you got to say to preserve your life. And I, won't, I don't want y'all in abusive relationships, but sometimes... What I'm, what I'm learning as a leader is sometimes people can't get out as quick as they want to. They have to plan their way out. Because when you, when you get hooked up with a narcissist, a narcissist is somebody that's crazy and they will have multiple personalities. You don't know which personality you're going to deal with, so you got to sometimes preserve your life. I didn't mean to go here, but I believe in our White House we have a narcissist sitting in the highest seat. That's why he can change faces. One day he's real nice. One day he's real crazy. One day he's meeting with black pastors. The next day he's calling LeBron and Don Lemon dumb. You, so you got you to gotta know who you're dealing with. And what, what David did, David tried to help Saul. He tried to deal with him. But at some point he realized, I've got to go. If I stay in this I'm going to die. I don't know who I'm talking to. Maybe it's somebody out in the internet line, uh, uh, land. If you don't leave the relationship, it's going to cost you your life. Start planning and start plotting now to get out. Call the police, but don't call from your cell phone where he paid a bill and it can't be traced. You better figure out what you're doing, but plan your escape to preserve your life, and God will bless you so you can get out. Do I need to deal with that anymore? Let me say, cause I'm feeling that strong. It's, it's been too many folk that's been abused and battered, and church folks say, well, what God put together, let no man put asunder. It's obvious God didn't put it together. 
So get out by any means necessary. You may have to come to me in my wife's house and we have to ask, like, have you seen so-and-so? No, I ain't seen her. Well, Pastor, you lying. I'm trying to preserve somebody's life. Amen. So you understand what I, where I'm going. I, I think it applies to other things, but it's only a few things that apply to. Don't just be lying all the time. I, mean, I want y'all to catch that because some of y'all lied just to lie. Let me, let me get on that for a minute. You just, you wake up Lying. Somebody say, what time you wake up? You woke up at 7.50. Oh, I got up at 7.30. You know you didn't get up. Why lie about stupid stuff? And what bothers me, people who get on Facebook and lie like we don't know your life. I ain't got time to get in that. All right. Just lie. So we're not talking about lying to lie. But we, 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 see, we see this. In a couple other places in Scripture, you see where God used deception for a reason. So by any means necessary. Let's go to uh, verse 8, 21 and 8. And David said unto Ahimelech, and is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He got out as quick as he could, but he didn't have anything to protect himself. Next verse says this, and the priest said, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. Let me put this up. Sometimes your last great victory is the only thing you have moving forward in uncertainty. Sometimes what God would tell you is look at what I did for you last. Even though what he did last don't help you with what you're going through now, but God wants you to hold on to what he already did. If he got you out of crack addiction and you might be in something new, he always will put something in your new place to remind you of what he already did. And so of all the people that David could have bumped into when he was running, he bumped into the priest that had the sword of the man that he took down. And this is what God was trying to show David. Even though you're in a by any means necessary mode, you're running, I got something to preserve you to let you know you're going in the right direction. I was talking to God, and, and when I say complaint session, it's not really a complaint, but I start off complaining, then I end up praying, then I end up apologizing, then I end up thanking the Lord. So I don't even know why I even try to complain, but sometimes stuff is going bad, so I try to complain, and I end up praising the Lord. But anyway, I asked God, I said, God, I seem, seem like I'm in a season of uncertainty. There's a whole lot of don't knows going on in my life. In other words, people ask me, what are you doing about this? My answer is, I don't know. Well, what, what's going to happen here? I don't know. What, what, what if you're going to try this? I don't know. What's going on with the school board? I don't know. So I'm like, God, I'm so sick of being in uncertainty. And God spoke this to me. He said, your uncertainty is a sign of your faith. Because even though you're uncertain, you're still walking. Even though you're uncertain, you're still moving forward. It looks like uncertainty to you, but to me, I call it faith. And so what God does in a season of uncertainty, he leaves you a clue to let you know you're headed in the right direction. And sometimes you wonder, God, am I even doing right? Am I going right? Do I need to change something? What do I need to stop? What do I need to quit? Nothing's working. And God leaves you a clue. Keep on moving forward. Sometimes I'm tired of God telling me keep on moving forward. I want to stop and stay here until you show me what's next. But guess what? That's not life. You can't just pause on the sideline and wait for everything, the picture become clear before you move. Uh, Martin Luther King said faith is taking the next step when you can't even see the stairway. Sometimes you just got to step again. I, 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 I've got... Uh, um, I put $1,000 in a stock about four or five years ago that I felt like God was telling me to put it in there. And that stock ain't done nothing but lose. I'm like, God, should I take it out? And he don't say nothing. 
God, did, did I put it in the wrong thing? I thought I did right. He don't say nothing. He just say, just keep moving forward. God, I wish you would tell me something. But God says, keep moving forward. Because what he's saying, what you can't see, I don't want you to mess it up. Because if I showed you what I was doing, you might mess it up. So shut up and keep moving forward so I can do what I got to do. Amen. Have you ever been a father or a mother driving on a long trip and the kids in the back, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When we going to get there? We've been in this car a long time. And I think God feels the same way when he's driving us to our destination. We're saying, God, what should we do? How are you going to fix it? And he just wants us to shut up and take the ride because he knows what he's doing. Sometimes when your parents are slick, they say play the ABC game. They're trying to get you to do anything but focus on where we're going. Daddy, I got to pee. You really don't have to pee. Okay, maybe I don't. You just, whatever you got to do to keep them focused. And God has us in the season. And David was running, but he left him a clue. You're going in the right direction. Let's go to verse uh, 10, 1 Samuel 21, 10. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. And so they, they, they were just reiterating what happened. And here's what's interesting. King Achish of Gath was a Philistine. Goliath was a Philistine. So he ran from the house of God and ran straight to the enemy. It's, it's a sad day when you can't find comfort in the house of God. There are some churches you will go to, you try to find comfort, they'll talk about you so bad, you'll run back to the streets because the church won't receive you. Don't let that be this kind of church. We want to receive everybody. I know folk have made mistakes but we want to receive everybody. Because the man who has the mic has made some mistakes too. My mistakes just haven't been caught. They haven't been put in the star press. So just because your mistakes is put in the star press, I'm still fighting for you. I'm still on your side. I don't want to be like Saul and run away the good help because I'm intimidated by them. I want everybody to have a place. So he had to run to the enemy's camp. But look what happened in verse 11. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? And this is interesting. He was anointed king in the position, but I mean, in his anointing, but he didn't have the position. But the enemy looked at him and said, ain't that the king? Sometimes folk in the world recognize your anointing before folk sitting beside you at church. Because you cannot hide a real anointed man or woman of God. You've been through so much hell and God is preparing you for a season and people notice it so much. They said, ain't that David the king? Isn't he the one that they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. See, this is what set Saul off. Because when the people start singing the praises, and start putting him above Saul, it messed with his mind. Never hang with somebody that cannot celebrate you when it's your turn to be blessed. As long as it's me, it's okay. But if y'all start talking about Melvin, then we got to change services. We got to do something different. No, I want y'all only talking about Andre. No, we need to be in a place where everybody can be celebrated. Everybody needs a turn. It was his turn. And so that's why he ran. But the enemy knew. Let's look at verse 12. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. David was not a fool. And one thing, when you are Christian, I'm tired of Christians that are foolish. Christians that don't pay attention. Christians that don't listen. Sometimes people are telling you how they feel about you and you don't listen. Maya Angelou said, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. So David was listening. And David knew, they talking about how I killed 10,000. But here's the thing, I killed 10,000 of the Philistines. And here I am with the Philistines. So I got to be careful how I move. Let me put it in today's vernacular. That's like me being a crip. And hanging out with the bloods, but I changed and I wore blue, so don't nobody know I was a blood. But then somebody said, ain't that the dude that used to kill all of us? 
wait a second. Let, 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 me, let me throw an, an, an odd thing in there. Sometimes when you are Christian and you're in places that you don't need to be trying to fit in, somebody will call you out. I remember being in college, and I had, I had went to a couple parties that night. I was on my third party. And I was on my third party, and uh, it was mainly white people who were, and where I was hanging out. In the last party, there were some black folk. And so I was going through the party, and I took it. I nodded my head up, and somebody said, ain't you that preacher's son from Muncie? I'm like, good God Almighty. What? How, I'm in Richmond, and somebody in Richmond told me, ain't you the preacher's son? I'm like, come on, dude, I can't even enjoy my, my party because you don't belong everywhere. Let me throw this out here, too. When, when you send your kids off to school, pray. God has all kinds of ways to get them back to where they need to be. Don't worry about it. You ain't got to check on them. You ain't got to spy on them because God will walk your children down. He'll walk your grandchildren down. I don't care what club they go to. I don't care what party they're in. When God wants them, God knows how to get them. He knows what he's doing. All right, let's go on. Verse 13. This is what David did. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. He put an Oscar performance. He put on a show. Sometimes when you're in a by any means necessary, sometimes you got to pretend just to make it. Sometimes you have to dumb yourself down to avoid conflict. Sometimes when a girl says, where you get that dress from? Oh, this old, uh, old thing. Sometimes you got to play like it ain't what it is. You just happen to be walking and some, you lift your foot up and somebody see red bottoms on the back of this and they get jealous and want to ask you a bunch of questions. Sometimes you have to minimize yourself because you are protecting yourself. Be careful when you're in the corporate world. And you're trying to go up the corporate ladder. Sometimes you can't say everything you know in the meeting because they'll skip right over you and won't promote you. Wait till you get the job to tell everybody what you know. Sometimes you got to pretend like you're crazy. Sometimes you got to dumb yourself down. Sometimes you got to act like you don't know nothing. Sometimes you got to act like you don't know who's talking about you. But God is showing you, never let everybody know everything you know. The wisest people sometimes move in silence. Smile at folk that hate you. Wink at folk that hate you because you're trying to preserve your life. You got to learn how to be wise in this thing. Everybody in your church don't like you. Oh, praise God. Everybody in your church is not happy when you get a fiance. So how do you handle that? You go to him and say, would you be in my bridal party? <laughs> oh, you want me in your bridal party? So, <sighs> there's an old saying, this is not scripture, but they say, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer so you can know what you're doing. I'm talking about in a by any means necessary season. I'm not talking about a normal season, but I'm talking about when you're trying to break through and the devil is using everything and everybody. And it's not always the people. It's usually the spirit trying to rule the people. But you got to be wise and you got to know what's going on. Sometimes it's your spouse. Sometimes you got to put money in another account that don't nobody know about to preserve your finances because your husband's so crazy. He'll go to the racetrack and spend it all and come back looking stupid with a lip out. And sometimes you got to put stuff back and save stuff by any means necessary. You got to figure out how to make it out of this life and God will help you preserve. But sometimes you got to do some strange stuff. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So here he is, acting like he's crazy. Let's go to 1 Samuel 21 and 14. I'm going somewhere with this. Achish said to his servants, look at the man. He is insane. Why are you bringing him to me? They, once David realized, these folk know who I am. He put on a show. 
And Achish said, man, get, get that dude away from me. Get him out of here. See, see, here's the thing. He was running there thinking he could find safety, and he realized this ain't a safe place. Got to get out of here. All right. Let's go to verse 15. And this is what the, this is what the king said. Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? I got enough crazy folk already around me. And anytime you're a leader, sometimes leaders attract the crazies. Sometimes when you're in a position, the crazies come to you. And so he said, listen, I got enough crazies. Must this man come into my house? And so David had to leave. This is interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture. When we get there, you're going to understand why I'm bringing up this strange story. There's a lot of stories in the Bible that you read and then you don't connect them all together until later. And you see what God is saying. So 1 Samuel 22. So that ends 1 Samuel 21. And that leads us right into 1 Samuel 22. And this is called the cave. So what happened was after he played like he was crazy to get out of the situation, he ran to an open cave. The cave happened to be fortified enough to where he can get in there and hide and do what he needed to do. First one of 1 Samuel 22. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down there to him. Once his true folk, see, I don't care where you got to run, your true folk will find you and will come and link up with you. That's what I want in deliverance. I want some true folk. I want some folk who will find people in a bad situation and come and show up for them. If we got to go to the courthouse, let's go to the courthouse in droves. If we got to go to the hospital, let's go in the hospital in droves. Whatever we got to do, when we find somebody in a cave situation, in a by any means necessary situation, we come to them and say, hey, how can we help? Next verse. This is also interesting. Not only did his family come, all those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented, gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Not only was he running, and he finds himself in a cave, and his family come, but all the other folk come. The folk that was in distress, in debt, discontented, and gathered around him, and now he's got 400 men. If you know anything about his story, a lot of these became mighty men that he would depend on. And this is what we got to understand, church. When we go against the grain, sometimes the wino comes to us. Sometimes the prostitute comes to us. But we can't turn anybody around. If they're going to come to us, if they're going to hook up with us, guess what we're going to do? We're going to communicate Christ's love compassionately. Everybody that comes can't give in the offering. Everybody that comes can't sing in the choir. Everybody that comes can't run the sweeper and can't do anything. But we're going to love them anyhow because you know what? We are in the mess, so anybody that's in the mess, come on. We all going to do it together. And what's happening in this city is this city keeps going through stuff. And people are sick of this city. Not the city per se, but the leadership in the city. And they're looking for real leaders. They're tired of Ball State. That can take a man like Papa John's founder and say, oh, he's okay with us. They're tired of the judges that give black men more time than anybody else. They're getting sick of it. And they're looking for somebody that will stand up. But here we are in the cave. And we think, don't nobody want us. But somehow they start coming to David. I don't see where he sent out a Facebook blast and say, hey, I'm in the cave. Come check me out. Somehow folk found him because you can't hide a real leader. I don't care what they're going through. A real leader finds a way to attract people, and they became his men, 400 of them. Look at verse 3. From there, David went to Mizpah and Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? I like the way David thought. David was in a season of uncertainty. And when his family came, he had so much honor and respect for his mother and father. He went to another king and said, can you take care of them while I go handle what I got to handle? 
Now let me stop and pause and throw this out here to all us men. All us men. I, deliver me from men who want to do everything but run their family through it too. Make sure your family is taken care of first and then you go out and do what you got to do. Well, pastor, I'm going to start another business. Do your, do your kids have the lights on? Is there food in the refrigerator? Stop jumping and doing everything and pulling your whole family in it. Make sure your family is taken care of. David said, I, I don't know what God's going to do with me, but one thing I know, I want the folk that's closest to me taken care of. If, if, if I got to wear a white beater and tattered shorts, I'm not standing in Jordan lines when my kids are going through hell. Let my kids be taken care of. Let my wife be taken care of. Let my mom and daddy be taken care of till I figure out what's going on with me. Amen. I told you I'm in a season of uncertainty. But what I'm not going to do is stop clocking in at the job and making sure my family's okay. I don't know what God is doing with me, but I'm still going to keep getting that paycheck because I got some people that I'm responsible for. Amen. Deliver me from people that only think about themselves and they put everybody through hell while they're working on themselves. Well, I'm chasing a dream. I'm trying to be an NBA star. Before you run all of that, take care of your kids, pay your child support, take care of the woman before you do all of that. David said, first thing I got to do, will you take care of my mama and daddy? Honor those who have sown into your life. Amen. There's some things that I'm trying in uh, myself as Andre Mitchell Ministries, but I'm not just doing everything because i got a church. I can't go preach around the world and y'all ain't seen me in six months and then I'll pop in and give you one raggedy message and go back around the world. No, I got to take care of what God has given me and you are who God has given me so I'm still here because you got to take care of first things first. In other words, so what I'm saying, in a by any means necessary situation, make sure you're the one going through most of the hell and take care of who you got to take care of. Don't forget uh, let, let, let's switch and talk about you, you, you women. You might be in a situation where it's depre you're depressed and you need pills to occupy, just to calm yourself. You need pills. But cook the meal before you take the pill. Bathe the kids before you take the pill. If you know the pill gives you some psychotic thoughts, I don't want you stringing your child in the middle of the night. I want you to take, if you have to say, I need a babysitter so I can go somewhere, do what you got to do, but take care of first things first. I know you're going through stuff, but there's people that depending on you, you can't, you can't do it. Oh, do I want to go here? Uh, I think, I think, I think I'm going to go here and go here. Sometimes single mothers don't know how to get the bills paid. So that means whether they like it or not, they find a sugar daddy to do what they got to do with them to get the money to pay the bill. I'm not judging you because I'm not a woman. I don't know what it's like to be a single mother. I'm not judging. But before you bring sugar daddy to your house, find somewhere for the kids to go. Don't let them see all the stuff you're going through to get yourself back together. Everybody you date, they are not supposed to meet. They're not supposed to be introduced. They got uncles all across the town. I don't know why they got so many uncles. Sometimes you got to hide stuff. It's not that it's right, but if you're stuck here, don't take everybody through what you're going through. All right. Let me go here too. If you're a cheating man, you got a wife, but you're a cheating man. You just can't get it right. Don't you put all your money on that mistress. Let her have baloney. You put the steak to the wife because you're stuck in something that you need to get out of. But don't be no fool. I hate to see people who are struggling turn around and just be a straight fool. She's been with you for 20 and 25 years and you're going to give the best Valentine gift to the girl on the side. You a fool. I don't know how I got on to that. First things first. 
So I, I'm not judging you. Sometimes you're caught up in things, and you don't, we don't know how you end up cheating. We don't know how you end up getting a sugar daddy. But you got to learn how, while I'm trying to work myself out of this and trying to get God to deliver me, I can't take everybody through the hell I'm going through. Amen. Set some stuff in place. Do some stuff. Have some. You got to have some 911 friends. That you can call, and I, I, I can't explain everything, but I, I need you to get my kids. Oh, it's going to be one of them nights. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you this time. But I need you to get yourself together. It's okay to tell people the truth, but we need people who are at least trying. I love seeing people delivered who at least try. At least try. Mm, my goodness, I'm going in directions I didn't want to go in. I got a little, I'm, I'm going to add this, and then, 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 then I got I to gotta jump off of this. You, 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 you're, you're a single mother, and the and the the baby daddy is still in the life, and uh, he's still around. So sometimes he stops by. Sometimes he spend the night. And sometimes he might want to rekindle the flame. Be wise in what you do. Make sure baby sleep because she's going to get confused and why, why, why daddy here. Make sure the boys sleep because it, it, gets, it gets a little confused. I'm not judging anybody, but when you're in a by any means necessary, sometimes you just have to be wise in how you handle the things. Now, of course, the best thing to say is just don't see him, but he, I, I, I'm honest. I know sometimes we get caught up in stuff. But even though you're caught up in stuff, do your best to say, God, I want you to help me by any means necessary, so I'm doing everything I can. Now, somebody said, get off of that, Pastor. Get off of that. Jesus. Enough of that. 22 and 4. So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. So it's beautiful that they were taken care of. Verse 5. But the prophet Gad said to David, this is what I love. David was in a, by any means necessary situation. He did everything he could. He, act, he, he lied. He acted crazy. He took care of his family. But then the man of God showed. That's why you can't never stop coming to church because you never know when the man of God will have a word just for you. But the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Herod. So this is what he said. I know you're here right now, but don't stay here. Go to the land of Judah. And this is the land he ran from. But the prophet said, go there. And if we know anything about scripture and about, about words and the meaning of words, the, the, the word Judah means praise. And so he said, I know you're stuck and you've done any things by any means necessary. You were just trying to make it out. But I got a word from you. Don't stay here. Get to that place of praise. I, I, I know you've done everything you can to pull yourself together and keep your family together. And you've done some stuff that ain't really ain't that Christian like. But I got a word for you. Get back to praising God. I know you had to take a depression pill, but I'm here to let you know. Get back to praising God. I know you had to do this and that, but I'm here to let you know. Come back to the house of God and lift your hands and praise God. It's time to come out of that place you're in and go back to praising God. Here's what's interesting. While he was in the situation, 400 men came and gathered themselves around him. So when he went to Judah, 400 people went to Judah with him. And here's something that you've got to understand. When you go to praise, somebody who's watching you starts praising too. You can lead somebody to praise. It's not that you're perfect, but you're saying with my mixed up, messed up self, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to give God some glory. I may be in the club right now at Saturday morning or Sunday morning, but follow me to Deliverance Temple because I know some folk that's going to love me and I'm going to praise God. It won't always be like this. I won't always be depressed. I won't always be addicted. I'm going to praise the Lord. I hear the word of the man of God. Get up and get to the place of praise. I'm here to let you know in your uncertainty, have a praise break in your car. Have a praise break on your job. Have a praise break in the shower. Have a praise break in the kitchen. Find a way to praise the Lord. 
some of this stuff is not going to break until you start praising God. Until you start thanking him for what he's already done. Until you start thanking him for bringing you out. God, I thank you for the money. God, I thank you for the husband. God, I thank you for the house. God, I thank you for the car. God, I thank you for the peace. Get back to the place of praise. May not be able to read scriptures. You may not be able to pray like you want to pray, but you can open your mouth and say, Thank you, God. <clears throat> Thank you that I got out of that situation. Thank you that you're bringing me out. Thank you that the addiction is ending. Thank you that peace is coming back to my life. Thank you that you're turning around. Thank you for protecting my kids when I did the stupid stuff. Thank you that when I was driving down the highway drunk, I didn't run off the side of the road. Thank you, God. I still love you. I still praise you. You're still worthy. You're still a great God. You're still Jehovah Jireh. I still praise you, God. And when the praise team is singing, you may not have the strength to get up and clap. You may not have the strength to wave your hands and stomp your feet. But sometimes you just shake your head and say, thank you, God. Here I am to worship. You might have to cry your way through praise, but get back to the place of praise. Because something's going to happen when we start praising God. Something's going to happen when we start praising God. Something's going to happen when we start praising God. One songwriter said, for the chains that seem to bind me, they fall powerless behind me when I praise the Lord. The message didn't break the chains off of my life. I tithed and it didn't break the chains off my life. I gave offering and it didn't break the chains off my life. And the only thing you got left is a crazy radical praise. A praise that don't make sense. A praise that before the praise team starts singing, you got a praise in your belly trying to break the back of the enemy. Saying, I'm glad I'm still here. I'm glad I'm still breathing. I'm glad I got a church that loves me. I praise you, God. I praise you, God. I praise you, God. Yeah, I've been sinning, but I praise you, God. Yes, I've been failing, but I praise you, God. Yes, I'm mixed up, but I praise you, God. Sometimes after you tried everything else, praise is all you got left. Praise is what I do when I want to be close to you. I lift my hands in praise. Oh, no, my circumstance, it doesn't even have a chance. I'll praise you in the good as well as in the bad. I vow to praise you, God. And I'm here to let you know those other things I told you, by any means necessary, it was in the scripture. I want, don't want you focusing on, focusing on deception. I don't want you focused on those things. I want to lead you to the place, the place of praise. Amen. Got a few more things to read, and this is going to make so much sense to you as we turn a corner. Not just praise, but a prophetic praise. Because what a prophetic praise is, is when the situation hasn't changed, but you praise them as if it had. When you still broke, but you praise them like all your needs are met. When you are laying in the bed lonely and you want a husband, but you don't have a husband, but you praise them for the man that's laying next to you, even though there is no man laying next to you, because it's a prophetic praise. When, where, where you take the seat next to you and you tell the seat next to you, you're going to be my son, you're going to be my daughter. You start looking at the empty seat next to you and start prophetically saying it's going to be who you want to be sitting next to you. you got to learn to praise God and if it's already done. Some praise is after it's done. Some praise is before it's done. Sister Diane, if Sister Diane comes to me and tells me on Wednesday I'm going to give you a check for $1,000, you think I'm going to be like, well, okay, I'll wait till I see it to praise you. I'm going to say, thank you. I appreciate you. I'll be at your house. Give me your address. I'll be waiting on you. Thank you. 
huh? And God is saying there's some stuff he's going to do. So start thanking him and say, I'm going to be at your house. I'm coming next Sunday and the Sunday after that. It don't have to, have to happen in 2018. It don't have to happen in 19. But I'm keeping coming to your house because I believe your word. Thank you for doing it, God. Thank you for bringing me out, God. Thank you for turning it around, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. A prophetic praise. Psalms 34. This is what I want to get to. And we've been reading everything in the NIV. And so I'm going to show you one other thing in the NIV. And then we're going to turn to the King James. Because it is the, um, it's the more common understanding. So this says, a Psalm of David. When he pretended to be insane before Abimelech. This confuses people because it doesn't say Achish. It says Abimelech. But Abimelech was the term for king. So a lot of times throughout scripture you will see Abraham went to Abimelech. Abimelech isn't the name. Abimelech was the title. So I put it in parentheses, the king, because we just read it. When he pretended to be insane, there's only one time in scripture where he pretends to be insane. And it has to be what I just read to you. Then it says, who drove him away and he left. Remember, he said, I don't want no more crazy people. Drove him away and he left. So, after he leaves, this is what he writes. Where was he writing this at? He was writing it in the cave. We're not talking about David in the kingdom. We're not talking about David on the throne. We're talking about the David that had to be in a by any means necessary season. And he had to get up and flee. And he flees to a cave. Takes care of mom and daddy. And all these broke folk come around. And this is what David writes. Did he write, I'm so sick of all this mess going on in my life. I'm sick of what God is doing to me. God, you bless everybody but me. I, I wonder if that's what he wrote. Let's see what he wrote. Psalms 34 and 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, we quote that all the time, but we don't understand the backstory. We thought he was with the gold and the silver. He was stuck in a cave after he acted crazy, but prophetically said, I will bless the Lord at all times. In a time like this, when I got all these debt, distress, crazy folk around me, I put my mom and daddy aside, but I really don't know if they're going to be taken care of or not. And this is what he prophetically says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And when we tell you that scripture, I want you to always remember, this scripture was not written on the mountaintop. This was written in the valley. This was written in the cave. When somebody was trying to kill him, and even the enemy didn't want him, and he said, I, I bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Even when I don't want to do it, his praise still comes out of my mouth. Even when I'm upset with God, because sometimes we get upset with God and still find ourselves saying, thank you, God. I still love you, God. I don't want to praise you, God, but I can't help it because his praise is in my mouth. Because I got breath, I got to praise him. I can't help but praise him. I can't help but give him glory. I can't help but lift my hand. I can't help but stomp my feet. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the law. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. This is what David said. There's nothing wrong with private praise. Private praise is okay, but sometimes you get in a situation where I'm going to praise so loud that other folk go hear. And guess what? They gonna hear, the humble folk going to hear and they're going to be glad. That's how you know who's on your team. Everybody that praises with you, there's somebody that needs to be with you. Anybody who laughs at your praise and tell you you're too radical, they don't take all that. They may not be the person you need to hook up with. But when I lift my hand and you lift my, your hand, when I holler and you holler, I know I got the right folk around me. I, the humble shall hear thereof and guess what? They going to be glad. Teresa is praising God for what he's going to do in my life. I haven't seen it yet. She hasn't seen it yet. But when I praise God for it, she gets happy like it's her because the humble share hear thereof and be glad. And then he makes this statement. Now, 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 
Once I find out who wants to praise with me, I can say this in verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Whenever you see somebody in church going for both praising, don't be looking at them. Praise with them. I don't know what they're working on. I don't know why they're dancing to themselves, but I'm going to dance with them. I don't know why they holler, but I'm going to holler with them. I don't know why they got a tambourine, but I'm going to have a tambourine too. I'm tired of Sister Darlene's whistle, but I'm going to buy me a whistle too, and I'm going to blow when she blow, because I'm going to praise the Lord together. Because desperate times call from desperate measures. And we need a breakthrough. We need a turnaround. We got too much junk going on in our lives. And we need to praise the Lord together. I might high five you. I might give you a shake in the hand. I might pump my fist. But we going to exalt his name together. Oh. And I like what's going on in this church. I'm seeing us praising the Lord together. Now this side over here. They know how to praise. And this side over here, they know how to praise. This side over here, they know how to praise. And this side over here, they know how to praise. If we all know how to praise, what we waiting on? Let's praise him together. As I'm coming to a close, I'm reminded of the time in my life when Borg Warner was hired, and I was told to put an application in by somebody very close to me, and it's like, I know so-and-so. I actually had a cousin who was in the hiring, and told me to put my name in. I put my name in. I got rejected. One of my good friends put his name in, and he got accepted. And the devil said, see, you need to be mad at him because he got what you didn't get. Then I got thinking, it's not his fault. Why is it his fault that he got the job and I didn't? So I went back to my raggedy glass factory job, and I made up in my mind every time I think about it, every time the devil tells me to be jealous, I'm going to praise. Not only did I do that, I put his name in my mouth. I said, thank you, God, for so-and-so and his job. Thank you for so-and-so in his job. Because if you think you're going to mess with me, I'm going to find a way to praise God together. Of course, it's not me. I didn't get the job, but he got the job, and he's my friend, so I'm thankful for him. And guess what? I praised like I was crazy until the devil stopped trying to make me jealous. Oh, about a year later, I stepped in a place called General Motors. And 21 years later, I'm sh still there. Now, now, Borg Warner is closed and gone, so this person doesn't even have the job that I had. God was, I mean, the devil's trying to make me jealous of something that wasn't going to materialize, but he had something for me. What God has for me, it is for me. I ain't got to be mad at you, but I can exalt his name together. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I, I got I to give you one more. This, we got about two minutes. Psalms 34 and 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. I don't know how I'm going to make it out of some stuff, but I sought the Lord. I came to church. I prayed before God and he delivered me from all my fears. Don't know what you're worried about, but all means all. All right. A little, little more. Now listen, this is crazy. Here, here I, I got to give you this. I got I to go just a little bit over time. I got to give you this. So, so when, when David acted crazy, the Bible says saliva ran down his mouth. It uses a Hebrew word that talked about him tasting the saliva. But when you go and look at verse 8, the same word pops up. He says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. The same thing that made him look crazy is the same thing he turned around and said, God is a good God. Yes, he is. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Try him and you'll see that my God is faithful. 
Give him a chance and you'll see he's able. Last few verses. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. If you just trust in the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, through the cross of Jesus Christ, you're made righteous. And it says his eyes are on the righteous. And his ears are open until they cry. Now, here's the thing. If you never get in a situation where you have to cry, you won't know his ears are open. But when you get in a crying situation, this doesn't just mean tears. It means when you got to holler and say, God, how much more can I take? God, I'm tired. God, help. God says, I hear it as a prayer. Because I call you righteous. Not because of what you've done, but because of my son. Verse 17 says this. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. If you didn't want to go anything, you joined the wrong church. Because we deliverance temple. We got to go through some stuff. How can we help somebody else if we've never done it? How can we help the addicted if we've never been addicted? How can we help those in an abortion if we've never had one? But here he says, he delivers out of all our troubles. All of our troubles. All of our troubles. All of our troubles. I got enough troubles to quit. You got enough troubles to quit. But he said he delivers us out of all. All the troubles. Last verse. Before I read it, I'll give you just a little context. I remember one time a prophet coming to the living temple over there in the other thing. It was a youth Sunday. The prophet was standing here prophesying to people. I was there walking up, prophesying to young people, prophesying college and all these good things. I was the very last person in the line. And everybody was shouting and dancing. When I got up, it was his turn to prophesy to me. He looked at me and he shook his head. I said, oh man, he's going to give me a good prophecy. He looked at me again and shook his head. And then he quoted this psalm. He said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. You know, I was thinking, God, you play too much. I done waited all this line. I done waited this long to get. A... And you're going to tell me, many are the afflictions. You see, all those other young people, they didn't have a ministry in them. You can't minister to somebody until you know what it's like to walk through hell. Until you find hell on the outside and hell on the inside. And you got to get back up and try to lead people. You know how hard it is to preach to you when I know I've messed up? But he said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I'm so glad the prophet didn't stop there. He said, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. And I'm here to let you know. I am that man today. And if you attach yourself to me and you attach yourself to this ministry, I can't promise you you'll never have another affliction, but I can promise you the Lord will deliver. The Lord will deliver out of them all. Not a few of them. Not some of them. But all of them. This is not just our time. This is our turn. Not only do we got next, we got now. And you know how we going to get it? By any means necessary. And the major one we're going to use is the praise that we have. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.